represent the government of the United States of America. We have permission from your government to board your vessel. Stop your engines immediately and prepare to be boarded. Stand by and prepare to be boarded. Nosotros representamos el gobierno de los Estados Unidos. Nosotros tenemos el permiso de su gobierno a abordar su barco. ghost ship is discovered adrift on the Caribbean. Another mystery for the men who patrol those waters of dreadful fascination, the infamous Bermuda Triangle. A 65-foot cruiser sets out on a leisurely voyage across the Bermuda Triangle. There are four men aboard. None of these men will be seen again. The Triangle contains many mysteries. It is the purpose of this program to explore one possible explanation. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Distress. Unknown. Vessel. The 7th District United States Coast Guard at Miami Beach is one of the busiest Coast Guard stations in the world. It may also be the best. It operates in that now legendary body of water known as the Bermuda Triangle. Its commander is Rear Admiral Robert Durfee. There are, as a matter of interest, uh, between eight and 900,000 registered recreational boats in this district. So this presents just a tremendous potential for people getting in trouble. Fully one-third of America's missing ships and planes vanish in the Bermuda Triangle. Many can be attributed to the inexperienced sailor lulled into a complacent carelessness by the nearness of land and the deceptive tranquility of the sea. As for the others, they have been attributed to such theories as magnetic anomalies, UFOs, lost continents. While some of these ideas may seem far-fetched, they stem from a desperate need to explain a host of disappearances which make no sense. One of the men looking for answers is Miami Herald reporter Carl Hyacin. He has concentrated on 44 recent disappearances and has studied the Coast Guard's explanations. They have nine that they said were presumed sunk, and, and I wouldn't quarrel with that, given the size of the ocean and the uh, number of inept or inexperienced captains. The impulsive thing to do down here is if you've got some money, you go out and buy a nice big yacht. Early in 1974, four young Philadelphia businessmen bought a nice big yacht. Their story, recreated for In Search Of, begins in Miami as they joked about venturing out into the Bermuda Triangle. They'd read up on the legends of the ghostly Spanish galleons on the Sargasso Sea, of the dancing coffins in a Barbados graveyard, of the haunted lighthouse on Great Isaac Rock. But to the four men that day, these were but fanciful tales from antiquity. They were men of today. John Tarquino, 42. Cy Sizentner, 32. Elliot Cohen, 30. And Raphael Kaplan, 26. And in a few weeks, they would set out on a shakedown cruise. In the beginning, they adhered to standard operating procedures. 
they filed a float plan. They were to be back in Miami on April Fool's Day. Their boat was moored in Dinner Key Marina near Miami Beach. They boarded as planned on the 1st of March, 1974, carrying the gear and provisions for a one-month voyage. The weather was good that year, and after a Philadelphia winter, Miami was a place of tropical promise. The ship was the Saba Bank. They had hired an experienced skipper, for this was not a toy, but a $300,000 boat. It was equipped for the wildest blow, with the finest navigational and safety devices that money could buy. Ten days later, the Saba Bank arrived shipshape in Nassau. In passing, they might have joked about the famous tales of the Triangle, of the five Avenger aircraft that talked to the control tower as they vanished forever, of a naval captain whose mind had darkened into madness while sailing through the Triangle. He had taken his ship, the Cyclops, into oblivion. The legends of the doomed sea must have amused rather than troubled the four men of Philadelphia. They were not seen leaving Nassau, but were spotted three days later at Port Royal, Jamaica, en route, they said, to Aruba in the Dutch Antilles. The Saba Bank was due back to the custom shed at Miami Beach on the 1st of April, 1974. A few boats came in that day, but none was the Saba Bank. On that April Fool's Day, a Philadelphia secretary began to make inquiries. At first they were casual, but as the days passed, there was a tinge of alarm. Okay, name of the vessel? Okay, do you know the uh, registration number of the vessel? Because the Saba Bank had filed a float plan, Coast Guard search and rescue could begin the moment the boat was overdue. But as the search expanded over 22 days to eventually cover a half a million square miles of the Caribbean, not a trace was found of the Saba Bank, its seasoned captain, and the pleasure-seeking new owners. They were never seen again. Two years earlier, the Coast Guard was faced with a case bearing a marked similarity. The boat was called the Como No. It was a sturdy vessel and 66-year-old Charles Fisher of Portland, Oregon had paid $100,000 for it. He and his wife Terry had sailed out of Fort Lauderdale in August 1972. To this day, no one knows how that voyage ended. During its subsequent search and investigation, the Coast Guard learned that the elderly couple had spent the fall island hopping in the Caribbean en route to their retirement home in Puerto Vallarta. They were seen on the 12th of December off Corinto, Nicaragua. All the Coast Guard ever found of Mr. and Mrs. Fisher and the ship, Como No, was a small plastic lifeboat. It was cases such as these, cases for which the Coast Guard had no ready explanation, that fascinated Carl Hyacin. One could talk of far-out Bermuda Triangle explanations, black holes, electromagnetic earthquakes, but Hyacin was exploring another possibility. The most celebrated disappearance in recent years was the case of the luxury yacht Pirate's Lady, owned by New Orleans millionaire Charles Slater. Slater is convinced his ship is still afloat, and he has put up a $25,000 reward. It was a burger yacht. I believe it was 75 feet long, cost over a million dollars. It had enough electronic equipment on it to uh, impress even, uh, you know, the most hardened, cynical of sailors. It was a fine, fine ship. 
and he sent his captain and a 17-year-old boy who he had known uh, as a crewman and had hired on as a crewman on the boat, a trusted family friend, uh, no suspicion of any uh, involvement. And uh, the boat uh, left New Orleans, refueled in Apalachicola. Uh, they were having some engine trouble. So they went into Apalachicola. Uh, next morning, the dockmaster heard the boat start up at 6.30 a.m. and leave. Was there some common factor that would lead to an explanation of these three disappearances and others like them? Investigators think they have an answer. An answer that seems wildly out of time in the 20th century. There is one hard fact. Many weekend sailors are known to have vanished in the past six years. Carl Hyacin does not pretend to have all the answers, but he has a theory, a theory that is cautiously accepted by the Coast Guard. Since 71, 71 through 77, they had um, 44 vessels that they uh, that disappeared and, and that they regarded as possible or probable, uh, I don't, let me take, not probable, they, they use the word very carefully, possible hijackings. The fear among yachtsmen is reflected by the words of marine insurance broker Ted Hall. 10, 15 years ago, uh, young college students or young folks used to come down here and hang around the docks on Miami and Beach or in the Lauderdale area, and if they wanted to go to the Bahamas, they'd go ask a yachtsman and the yachtsman uh, would take him to the Bahamas, free of charge. That's all stopped. Most yachtsmen will not take anybody on board. I, I've had a friend that said that he saw a barometer that he'd given another friend who the family turned up missing, but here this barometer was uh, on an island in, uh, in the Bahamas for sale in a gift shop. There is a growing suspicion that a number of seemingly inexplicable disappearances can be laid at the feet of a bizarre anachronism, the plundering buccaneer. The modern pirate does not fly the Jolly Roger or lurk in the remote coves of the Spanish Main. There is reason to believe that the modern pirate strolls the streets of Miami Beach, made undetectable by his commonplace appearance and his belief in the age-old tradition of piracy, that dead men tell no tales. Hyacin has developed the profile of the typical modern buccaneer. A cold-blooded person, fairly intelligent and uh, ironically a uh, pretty personable sort of character. And this is the sort of thing that happens. They make friends with them, they let them come on board, and they might mention uh, that the, the wife has some diamonds with her or something, and then, the, you know, the fellow says, oh, really? The pirate is looking for a congenial victim, a man proud of his boat, a man who doesn't ask for credentials or identification, the type of person who will sign his own death warrant. As seen in this reenactment, the typical pirate of today must first discover essential facts that make a particular vessel the perfect target. The vessel has no specific float plan, its destination is not defined, its schedule is undetermined. The buccaneer will have the necessary time to complete his deadly deed. He knows that boat owners can be like kids, even to wearing official looking uniforms. In these cases, another thing that happens frequently is that the boat leaves, and this, in the case of the Pirate's Lady, it leaves virtually unnoticed, it, either late at night, early in the morning, it motors out very quickly, there's no chatting around the dock, uh, no, you know, buying a six-pack and, and uh, shooting the breeze with the dock master, the boat is gone bright and early. Now it is just a matter of time until the victim takes his would-be killer to a suitable secluded piece of open sea. In each of these cases, the boat was outfitted for a long voyage already. That is, there were provisions, there was fuel, there was charts, uh, there was either radar or uh, certainly radio, long distance communication. There was everything they needed to make a good long trip.
by changing the, some of the lesser works topside, mass, some parts of the superstructure, or changing the, just the color combination on those parts, adding canvas parts, taking canvas parts off, you can change the looks of a vessel quite easily and quite quickly. Florida coast, with its overgrown bayous, is ideal country for the pirate. Here, he can affect the facelift on the yacht if he wants to use it. But why would a man commit piracy and murder? Why would he take these risks? Does piracy have another motive? If an expensive boat is stolen, it can be altered. But the basic structural design, as well as registration licenses, cannot be erased. We are a nation of record keepers, identification numbers, state forms. So a pirate knows he would get caught trying to sell such a boat or parading it himself. What use is it then? In the waters south of Miami, piracy today is almost commonplace and there appears to be a possible explanation. In four of the confirmed cases of piracy, the hijackers were in the drug trade. We asked Hyacin if most hijackers are connected to drug traffic. In my opinion, I think they probably would be, mainly because of the areas they've taken place in, it's particularly off Mexico and Colombia. Uh, there are captains that I know, people that I spoke with, who uh, reputable people who have sailed these waters for the better part of their lives, who no longer go anywhere near Colombia, for instance. Also the waters of Honduras, and anywhere in that neck down around the Panama Canal zone. Uh, some of your underwriters will not let boats go and transit through Colombian waters. The drug traffic from Colombia into Miami travels one of the busiest crime routes in the world. Today we're going to be auctioning a 1973 28-foot Donzi. This is a common ceremony in Miami. The public auction of a drug boat seized off South Florida. Somewhere in this crowd of honest, legitimate bidders may be the front man for a crime syndicate with the ready cash to put a seized vessel right back into the drug trade. On this particular day, the boat is bought by a water skier, but it is generally believed that a number of the supercharged speed boats that fill the waters of South Florida are in the drug trade. They are used by the big syndicates to run dope in from other ships which sit out in international waters. In the mid-70s, the Dauntless and other Coast Guard vessels working with the drug enforcement agencies and U.S. Customs had been relatively successful in breaking the big heroin syndicates. Now, cocaine and marijuana began to appear in huge quantities. At about the same time, Coast Guard Captain Edmund L. Cope noted a curious new development in southern waters. Private yachts began to disappear. Boats that could make a long trip without the necessity of mother ships or messenger boats. Why were these boats being pirated instead of purchased? It appears that a new and more deadly breed of drug runner is now abroad. The lone wolf with connections in the drug culture but operating outside the big crime syndicates. Boats were being hijacked because the guy couldn't afford to buy one that size. Couldn't buy what he needed to get involved in his particular business would be, which would be running marijuana from the Gulf Stream into the Florida. What sort of boats were these men looking for? The Coast Guard has prepared a profile of a potential victim. Well, it would have to be a boat that's capable of going a long ways with a good-sized cargo. That is a long-legged yacht. Otherwise, it's not worth it. It's not worth it to steal it. It's not worth it to kill people on board. It's not worth it to try to stuff a lot of drugs inside of it. Um, they want something that'll hold a lot. Just such a boat was the Saba Bank, which disappeared on April Fool's Day, 1974. The perfect victim for a hijacker. In studying the Coast Guard investigation, Hyacin learned that when the boat was last seen in Nassau, the owners were observed in conversation with persons described as drug or hippie types. Did the four Philadelphia businessmen invite these people to join in the fun trip to Jamaica and in effect arrange their own murder? No one knows for sure, for no one saw them leave and their disappearance remains a mystery. 
And what about the Como No and the elderly couple en route to their retirement home? The Coast Guard discovered that they were carrying their life savings, $30,000 in cash, and that this fact was well known around the marinas. Also, there was the daughter who gave evidence that she had received a letter from the couple. They wrote that they had taken on a pair of strangers as deckhands and admitted they had become afraid of them, but did not know how to get rid of them. Had this couple issued an invitation to their own murder? If you're a freelancer and if you're dirt poor and you have no boat and a boatload of Americans pulls up offshore with a nice yacht and you've got about two tons you can get to someone in uh, Boca Raton, to my way of thinking, uh, it, the Americans, uh, you know, are as good a target as anybody. The people that, you know, do the drug, so-called drug hijacks, whatever, for whatever motive a yacht is hijacked, are generally not professional smugglers or professional criminals. They're people that have no other option, because uh, it's not a particularly safe crime. And so there appears to be ample evidence that piracy on the high seas may account for some of the unexplained mysteries of the Triangle. Which is not to say that all the deadly secrets have been unlocked. The curious and tragic events of these mysterious waters are too complex for a single simple solution. The bulk of the clientele in this Fort Lauderdale gun shop is yachtsmen. Where they formerly bought sports rifles, they are now buying what are called people killers. Boat owners are interested in self-defense. How would this be for the boat, you think, for protection purposes? That's all I'm looking for. Very, very really, uh... formidable. That particular weapon there. Uh-huh. And yet, even with powerful guns, there are dangers in the triangle which man and all his firepower may be unable to conquer. <laughs> 